Então, eu vou falar das três pessoas que vão falar agora e depois eu não vou apresentar elas individualmente. É, a gente vai abrir com o Cameron Elon. O Cameron, para quem é, ele trabalhou por um bom tempo como biofísico, trabalhou num, numa fonte de nêutrons é, no Reino Unido, chamada Isis, e sempre foi um, um defensor aí do, do acesso aberto, e hoje trabalhando e, e de pensar novas formas de publicação científica. Ele é uma das pessoas também que vai falar na sessão sobre cadernos científicos abertos. É, hoje ele trabalha para a Public Library of Science, como diretor de advocacy, né, que a gente tenta trazer como defesa, mas não é exatamente a, a palavra adequada. Vai. Bom, adequada é. E, e justamente dentro de uma instituição, a PLOS, que trabalha muito com essa questão de tentar pensar métricas alternativas é, na ciência, dentre outras coisas. Né? A PLOS faz mil coisas. É, junto do Cameron, vai falar. E, e o Cameron tem outro, outra coisa interessante, e acho que isso é uma coisa interessante dessa mesa, são... Tem, pessoas que tiveram muito ligadas a, a momentos importantes de registrar, é, de esclarecer o que, que é certos avanços na publicação na publicação da ciência. Né? O Cameron ele fez parte do, da publicação dos Penton Principles, que começaram a definir, fizeram a primeira proposta estruturada do que seriam dados abertos científicos. Né? É, dentro de uma discussão muito maior sobre dados abertos de governo, dados abertos de empresas, o que seriam dados abertos científicos. Uh, dados científicos abertos, né? como se deveria fazer essa publicação e tudo mais. A outra pessoa que vai falar é o Leslie Chan, que está ali no canto, que vocês já, já ouviram, no, se vieram no primeiro dia, já viram ele falar é, sobre outro assunto. O Leslie ele é professor de estudo mídia e desenvolvimento na Universidade de Toronto, né? professor da Universidade de Toronto. Foi um dos responsáveis por criar aqui, no, junto com grupos aqui no Brasil, o Bioline, que é um uma espécie de acervo online de publicações de acesso aberto, que até tem um fato interessante de ser, até preceder em algum tempo o Cielo, uh, e provavelmente servir de inspiração para essas coisas todas, e ainda em funcionamento. E, e, e de ter, uh, assim como, como, como o Cameron ajudou na fundação dos Planton Principles, o Leslie foi um dos, assinando, dos primeiros a firmar a Budapest Open Access Initiative, que foi a, um documento que estabeleceu um pouco, estabilizou a noção e, 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 e permitiu escalar a noção do que é acesso aberto para que houvesse um diálogo mais estruturado no, ao redor do mundo. É, então, acho que a gente quer falar de avanços e das próximas perspectivas, quais são os próximos passos em publicação científica e avaliação, né? quais são as inovações de publicação. Acho que a gente conseguiu trazer pessoas que já têm um, um, um registro de muito, de muito, muito ousadia e muito sucesso nessa área. É, nesse aspecto. E a terceira pessoa, é, através de uma geração seguinte, é, já considero da minha geração, o Daniel, que tem é, um, um currículo muito bacana e talvez uma das pessoas mais inovadoras em pensar publicação científica e como é, estruturar e, e, e o reconhecimento dessas coisas. Ele se formou, ele se, a formação dele é de biofísica, mas hoje ele trabalha como é, como é, informata da biodiversidade, digamos assim, no museu que é Biodiversity Informatics, que ele chama, no Museu para a História Natural de Berlim. É, e ele foi, dentre outras coisas, ele foi um Wikimedia in Residence in Open Science, que é um, uma atividade que ele pôde exercer é, com apoio da Fundação Wikimedia, que é da, tá por trás da, tá à frente, ao lado da Wikipédia, digamos assim. Uh, e da Open Knowledge Foundation. E ele recebeu, ano passado, o... Estou sem som aqui. Tá ok. Uma quantidade enorme de, de, de informações publicadas no, no PLOS e outras revistas. Projetos Wikimedia, é, onde elas podem... É, tem um outro espaço de registro do seu uso, de relevância e tudo mais. Uh, de uso e de registro. Então, um, so, as with as with the previous speakers, I'd, I'd really like to thank the organisers for bringing um, all of us here um, to what has been a really diverse meeting, lots of different perspectives, lots of different concepts 
of what the issues we're dealing with, um, with are really are. And I'd particularly like to thank the previous panel who have led in absolutely spectacularly into um, what I want to talk about. And I want to focus mainly on uh, research assessment. I want to address those questions of how we tackle the issue of telling stories about why the research we do matters. And I'm going to start from a really quite instrumental and STM-focused perspective, but I want to try and tell a story which will take us into a space that will help us to think about how we can broaden that out and how we can do more than just talk about citations or patents or specific kinds of outcomes that are specific to particular kinds of research. So as the, the last panel finished, um, we have a series of problems. In particular, we have this problem of incentive structures that may well have been appropriate in the 18th, 19th, early 20th, maybe even mid 20th century, but which are increasingly creating perverse outcomes in the research community. And we need to understand how we can deal with the question of persuading the people, telling the people that actually pay for the work that we do as researchers that it is of value, but perhaps more importantly, tell the story of why we made the choices we did about what to fund, how to do the research, how to communicate it, and how to ensure that it has the maximum outcome. So I'm going to almost completely invert the principle that, that Paul started with at the beginning of the meetings and start with a de novo engineering kind of concept of how this might work in a perfect world. So in a perfect world, we would have a set of shared values. And we would use those shared values to create institutions that had a clear statement of what their mission was, what it was they were there to do. Given that mission... We would then seek to find evidence and data and information that helps us to assess how well that institution performs against that mission. And we would use that to iterate over time, to improve our processes, to make choices, to take the strategic decisions that would help us deliver on the mission and ultimately to reflect the values that started this whole process off. Before. As I say, I'm starting from a kind of de novo perspective. The problem we have is that many of the things we value in research are very difficult to measure and have traditionally and continue to be very difficult to measure in any coherent, scalable fashion. And what that has meant is that we're focused on the things that we can measure and those have, by default, become the mission generate patents, publish in journals with high impact factors, despite the fact that these do not tell us anything whatsoever about how the public and wider investment in research is actually creating a better world, either for the people who paid for it or for the communities as a whole. So that leaves us with a question, again, as, as responsible guardians of a public trust in the form of the money which is given to us, how can we do better? And that is a question that I think we just need to continually ask ourselves over time. And of course, because I'm a quantitative scientist, I will always say that more data is the answer. And we can say that more data might be an answer, in part because of the way that scholarly communications, in the way that the application of research has changed radically over the past 20 years. And in particular, as research has moved online and as the use of research has moved online, we've shifted from a world where you needed to leave a mark behind deliberately to show some form of use. You'd have to actively choose to mark the path you've taken through citations, through some sort of direct acknowledgement, to a world where, as Jason Prem says, it's as though there's been a fresh fall of snow. And you can see the footsteps of all the interactions of everyone who is touching a piece of research, who is using it, who is citing it in the old-fashioned way, but also who is using the software, who is changing 
the software, who's creating the data, using the data, talking about it online in social spaces. Suddenly we have a lot more information, a lot more sources of data about what research there is and how it's being used. So does that mean more data is the answer? Well, there's two problems with this. One is that data can never be the answer itself. Data is not information, information is not knowledge, and knowledge is certainly not wisdom. But perhaps more critically, many people would ask, is the data actually telling us about the things, again, that we care about? We may have more of it, but is it relevant to the questions that matter? So I want to tell a story. And this is a story about research done in South Africa. And I was looking at research from the University of Cape Town, published by PLOS, as it happens. It's not particularly relevant to the story. And I was interested in the geographical location of where tweets about this research were coming from. And I'd look at these papers using an available data source called altmetric.com, which happened to do this mapping of where the tweets come from, of where the Twitter activity around these papers, that mentions these papers, is coming from. And there's a very consistent pattern. And that pattern was a gap. You spotted the gap yet. Which country is missing? Which country, if you were talking about research coming from South Africa, might you hope is a place where that research is actually being talked about. So I kept working down this list of articles. And then I found one. I found an article that had um, a number of tweets from South Africa itself. And it's not a huge number. These are small numbers. And we have other data on how many people have downloaded this paper and how many times it's been cited and how many times it's been bookmarked. Lots. We have lots of data about this paper. And had I looked at that data as a whole, I would not have spotted that article, the one with the green arrow, as particularly being an outlier from the rest of the activity. The data itself would not have told me this story without digger deeping. Deep, deeper digging. <laughs> but once I'd found it, this turned out to be a very interesting article. It's about the relationship between HIV status and domestic violence perpetrated by black South African men in Cape Town. And the tweets were coming from sexual health clinics, women's crisis centres, and people concerned about gender relations in a South African context. This is the kind of story that the Vice-Chancellor or President of a university is desperate to know about and to talk about to funders. The author of the paper was unaware of this. So I could create this story, I could dig into the data and tell a story about why this particular research, not just did, that it mattered because it was about the health of people locally, but that it mattered because this crisis centre had picked it up and was looking at it and was thinking about it and saying that it was important to their day-to-day -day practice. Not citations, not patents. Actual use of research. This is gold dust, if you can find it. But there's a problem, and that problem is I uncovered this by spending several hours digging into a relatively small data set about a relatively small number of a few hundred papers, and I knew what I was looking for. Telling stories is great, but it doesn't really scale. It doesn't scale to the level of helping the minister decide whether to put money into chemistry and analytical chemistry or into biodiversity and how to make those decisions. And those are the decisions that need to be made. We can't shy away from the notion that those are the choices that at the end of the day are made and are actively made in the conduct of deciding how to resource research. So we have a term, this may be a term which is specific to the UK, European or, or North American research context. We talk about research impact. And this is a term with an interesting history 
because it started off as economic impact and then everyone said, oh, but there are more kinds of impact than economic for research. We shouldn't just focus on the economic impacts of research. So they dropped the economic and now we talk about impact in this sort of vague and diffuse form. And we mean it to be the way in which the research changes the world in a, in a broader sense. And that might be through further research, it might be in educational settings, it could be in health, the environment. It can be cultural impact, and particularly important for the humanities and social sciences. And it can also be, and we shouldn't shy again shy away from the idea that economic impact matters to the people who fund research. And we have assumed, because this word has such potency and power, that these things are all somehow a, a concept that we can work with, that we understand what we're talking about, and that we know what we mean. The problem is, there's nothing there in the middle. These things don't have anything in common except our obsession as researchers with telling a story about why our research matters. What we're actually talking about is how research is converted into some form of output and how that output then diffuses into the wider world. And part of the story we've heard over the last few days actually is that picture's a rather outdated one because the distinction between the conduct of the research and the outputs is becoming a lot more blurred that the research itself is in part conducted through conversation, through collaboration, increasingly um, importantly. So, and then the other aspect that's important is actually that those outputs, those, those impacts in the wider world, are actually becoming much closer to the research that itself, that through direct interaction, through citizen science, through these other processes, we want to bring these aspects of use and application closer to the research we do. So let's focus in on what perhaps is the most familiar case here, that of, of research being converted into, into further research. It's being reused and applied in a research setting. We think of that as a translation through the research process to these outputs and into, into another lab or into another, into another research group. And we've traditionally measured that through citations. And we've aggregated these things up and called them impact factors, and we keep blaming other people for the use of these things, but these are all choices that our community, the research community at least, has chosen to make over time. And the point about how the world is changing is that we're no longer restricted to just that citation. So now there are services where academics and researchers are involved in bookmarking articles. And this bookmarking occurs before the citation. So it's further back in this process. So we can detect something rather earlier in this process of transfer of research into further research. We can perhaps go right back into the early places and start to ask questions about whether two people are already working together, whether they're part of a common team. We can ask about whether they've been to the same conferences, whether the information is being transferred through these other media. And we can imagine this as a process which we can track through these particular events that occur. So again, let me back up one point. The thing we're trying to maximise is the blue circle, or the blue circles. We have a notion of a process which is driving this, that the research process and the research outputs are in some way transferred and converted into this further research. And we have these signals, these events that occur along this path that we think we understand. Except that we don't see any of it except the signals. This is all we get to see. And all of the systems we've built up over the last 50 years, this whole complex picture which I showed you about knowledge transfer, actually we've based everything on this one signal. We told ourselves a story about what was happening to lead to that signal, which we know manifestly to be untrue. And we've built entire global systems of reward and validation and certification and quality assurance on the basis of the assumption that this is the way the world works and that this is what we care about, that this is what we value. Today's world looks like this. We have these signals, these flares that will pop up all over the place and lots of different processes going on. We can imagine 
we can seek to model the processes which might be underlying these. We don't actually know necessarily what these processes are. And that's before we even start to talk about the things we heard about this morning, where the use of that research can then be used to reinform further research in the processes itself. So we can do a whole series of things. We can look for evidence that paths we think exist have been tracked along at some point. But perhaps more importantly, we can look for new forms of the transfer of knowledge. That this data can support us in discovering and understanding the fact that actually the majority of the use of research is through people taking multimedia files and putting them on Wikipedia. Or that it turns out to be really critical for something to be translated into Portuguese, for it to have its actual application, if it's about Chagas in Peru. And we can look for things that are ephemeral, for traces that maybe don't last for very long, though that raises some interesting issues around privacy and other things. And we can also imagine that some of these things are things we can look back into the past and see what was there before and ask whether these processes are changing or whether they've stayed the same. The data exists to start tackling these questions. And I'm not going to talk much about new innovations and mechanisms for scholarly communication per se, partly because we can talk about that in the discussion, but partly because everything is possible. Anything you can imagine, we can build. We can choose to build this stuff. But we have to find the paths by which information is actually travelling and we have to choose to facilitate its flow, to maximise its flow and to reward the people who seek to maximise its flow and to build the tools that help us to make this happen. Those tools do not need to look the same as the tools we have today, the systems that we have today. They need to be familiar enough that people adopt them, and there's another whole conversation to be had about technological adoption. You've heard some of those issues again this morning. But we have the opportunity to reimagine based on what is actually being done and what's actually being used. So I'm telling you almost a techno-utopian story here about how big data can, can save us from ourselves, can tell us how to redesign our systems and our institutions so as to enable us to transfer information in the, in the, in the most effective way. But what does that mean we do? To, to answer the question of the previous panel, it's all very well to say these things would be great if they existed, but how do we get there from here? And part of the answer is actually something that Paolo said. It just takes the courage of the institution to say, this is what matters. We don't care about patents. That's a very powerful statement if someone's prepared to make it. We could get rid of the issue of the impact factor tomorrow if institutions simply decided that that wasn't the basis on which they were going to judge people and said it. I started my life as a researcher at a university. I knew that everything in the world was the fault of either funders or publishers. I then moved to work at an organisation that was a funder, where I knew that everything that was wrong in the world of research was the fault of either the researchers or the publishers. It won't have escaped your notice that I now work for a publisher. We need to do what we can do ourselves and stop blaming other people. And to do that, we can use this data environment to tell the stories of why the research matters and to understand how we can make it matter more. Anita Devard... I have friends who work for Elsevier. Has this talks has a wonderful talk, and I recommend you, you look for this online. She's talking about how the rhetorical structure of research works. And perhaps in the context of how we've talked in the last two, we should talk about evidence rather than data. But the bottom line is, this is what we need to do. We need to go out and tell the stories of why this research matters, to understand how this is going to work. We need to scale this out, and we need to do that by building abstractions that help us to understand how these information flows work. And that is going to be uncomfortable because it means turning the microscope on ourselves and treating ourselves as researchers as an object of study. We've already, again already heard today that researchers don't like that. But we need to build these models, and we need to test these models. 
and then we need to act on them. And I think the opportunity that we have, and I'm stealing um, an analogy, a metaphor, I don't think it's a paradigm, um, from my friend Anna Nelson, and I don't know whether this will work in Portuguese or not, but, but she, makes, she makes the point that when we, whenever we talk about a problem, we always frame a problem. Any method we use to critique or understand what is going on, we create a frame in which we illustrate the points we're trying to make and we bring evidence, we bring objectives, and we bring our own biases into that system. Because what is really important about ideas of big data, what the power of this is potentially there, is that we can stop thinking about framing pictures and we can start thinking about building window frames. The frame still affects our view. We still need to understand how it limits our view on the outside world. But we can actually challenge ourselves to observe what is happening. And in the end, that is what researchers do. We just never apply that system to our own practices, which is a rather interesting weakness given the extraordinary claims we make for the knowledge that we create using this system, that we're not prepared to actually apply it to ourselves. So I haven't actually used the word open throughout, I think, this entire talk. And the reason for that is because I don't think this actually relates to open per se. For me, it relates to the much bigger picture, which is that as guardians of a public trust, our obligation is to seek to maximise, in whatever sense we mean, our performance, the, the value that we create, the values that we create, the qualities that we create from research. And for me, open is a natural way to do that. But actually, open is just part of this question of how we maximise the use, reuse and application of research. Um, and I'll stop there and we can come back to questions and the issues that raises later. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, like David this morning, who was, uh, who was adapting his talk from all the other talks being in and uh, uh, giving us new ideas and so forth, um, I have to also try to adapt what I was going to say uh, earlier today. But then uh, last night, uh, Cameron and I over cocktail, we're talking about what he was going to talk about, and he showed me one of the diagrams. I said, yeah, and in fact, I have a similar diagram, and then I draw it this way, and he showed me the next diagram, he said, did you mean it this, like this? <laughs> so, so I said, we're hanging out too long together. We're starting to think alike, so it's kind of scary. But uh, it's, again, in many ways, too, he had given uh, the key message of what I want to convey, but I would tell the story slightly differently. Uh, so. So uh, some of you may have heard him, say, him refer to himself yesterday as a recovering alcoholic, meaning he's lucky enough to have escaped the institution, uh, whereas I am still very much uh, alive and kicking within an institution, uh, in fact, a fairly big one uh, in North America. And so I'm very familiar with the kind of challenges that uh, Yuri was bringing up about how universities are really not places of freedom uh, and innovations and so forth, and there are lots of institutional uh, constraints that we have to kind of jump over uh, in order to do what we really like to do. So uh, I want to, within that framing, talk about what is still possible and how open, uh, open access, openness itself has allowed me as a researcher to push back uh, in the kind of institutional boundaries uh, that is actually becoming increasingly rigid over the year and to me openness is a way to escape uh, to allow us to to uh, push back and raise new questions uh, that that were increasingly being not asked by, our, by ourselves uh, and, and I agree with Cameron it's our own fault uh, we, we just subsume we're by the system and we just sort of act what the system asks us to do uh, and we're actually academics are very very subservient servants and uh, they just do what they're told or what the system tell them to do and they don't question uh, and yet they like to blame uh, the system all the time uh, but they don't do much about it uh, so some of you might have seen this quote as well uh, a famous quote by Einstein I hope I 
this is actually, you know, uh, his quote, you know, because you never know uh, these days. There's a lot of misattribution. Uh, anyway, uh, it essentially sets what, uh, what Cameron had illustrated very elegantly, that you know, there are lots of things that we count because we can, because they're easy to count. Uh, and yet there are many important things that we ought to be counting, but we don't because we don't have the, the where at all to be able to capture uh, uh, those kind of importance. Uh, and so that, that is really, again, what I want, want to reinforce. And I have some questions that, again, stemming from my own personal experience. So in the early days when the web came, came along, in the early 90s, I became very, very interested in the web as a, as a tool for scholarship, for, for both teaching and for, for, for research. I mentioned yesterday the early involvement I had with this project called Bioline in, in dealing with, with publishing online, but I was very, very interested in, in also the pedagogy of the, uh, of, uh, of the learning, uh, of the kind of things that David talked about this morning. Are, are we really entering a new world of learning whereby we can uh, enable students to truly collaborate and create, co-create knowledge and ask questions and, and, and so forth. Uh, uh, and if so, uh, uh, what kind of tools and then kind of uh, 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 environment do we need to create? So I spent quite a number of years doing all these kind of things and my colleagues always tell me, uh, you're committing academic suicide. Uh, you know, none of these is going to be none of these is going to be counted. All they're going to count is your student evaluation form uh, and how many publications you have and so forth. And in fact, I have to say, uh, I continue to teach and try to push the boundary of online teaching. And two years ago, I taught a course uh, completely online that for the first time. I always use brand. Uh, kind of blended approach, but last year I taught a course completely online, and I have the worst student evaluation I've ever had in my 20 some odd years of teaching, because students just do not want to be, they are so socialized into learning in a certain way in our classroom. They come to a big classroom, they take note, and they take their midterm, and then take the final exam. They are very comfortable with that system of evaluation of learning. So when I push, take them online and say, we now want to collaborate. We want to, I'm not teaching you anything. You have to go out and find out what you're supposed to learn and we will co-create this learning environment and so forth. And some of the criticism of the course was, I, I, I need to frame some of those kind of things. But out of some 30 some more students in that class, two or three of them uh, went on to take some of my other courses, and they are the students that to me were, were the most outstanding students in terms of, of somebody who is going to go on you know, to do very interesting thing outside of academia or continue to do academia because they have taken on the role of learning that they've taken ownership uh, of, of asking questions and so forth. So to me, the question is, how do I get evaluated uh, for that? It was a very murky one. Now, I tell my youngest uh, colleagues not to do it because I, I have a permanent job in the university so I can explore. But for a young scholar, I tell them, don't do it because you will commit academic suicide. Uh, publish, just get, a, get your grants published. And then after you get tenure, play around, and you should afterward. Uh, but somehow, uh, that system is very, very difficult. Uh, so uh, does it count? This is still the question that I'm asking. Doing all these risky thing in the electronic space, including on this open access, open scholarship, and so forth, creating new kinds of uh, uh, artifacts, you know, curating databases and, 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 and software and creating uh, different kind of interactions, spending all your time on communities, uh, helping other people do things uh, instead of publishing. How is that going to be uh, rewarded? Um, and the, the other question is if, if, you know, we all love to criticize the journal impact factor. We all know a million reasons why it's so bad from a mathematical, technical transparency standpoint. We can all name them, and yet we love to have them, right? If you had your paper published in the high impact journal, the first thing you're going to tell your friend, oh yeah, I got published in this journal, it's 6.024, uh, <laughs> whatever that means, right? We, we've all seen that behavior. Uh, and we know that it's bad, but yet the more university 
uh, and more universities are getting more and more wedded to, to these impact factor. Uh, and I, the sad thing is m wherever I travel uh, uh, to other parts of Africa, most universities are increasingly being bound by the journal impact factor. And I'm sure in Brazil the same way. I run into colleagues all the time and they're told that they have to publish in high impact journals and most of them exist in the West, outside of Brazil. So they have to publish in English in journals that have impact factor in order for them to get evaluated and so forth. So I, I'm sure you're very familiar with that. So it's very bad, but it's actually being used more and more. Uh, that's the irony. And so there are people who have been coming out with these so-called alternative metrics, and some of you have seen them online, article level metrics, uh, and now Twitter feed, and you get social sharing, the slide shares, and YouTube, and so on and so forth. Uh, speaking of YouTube, I also have given one of these local TED talk, and I was so proud after a few months, there was 5,000 hits, and I was telling my son, and he said, so what? My neighbor's dog farted on, you know, they, they took the videos and it was 30,000 hit overnight. <laughs> so, so that kind of put it in perspective for me, you know. So <laughs> it, what does 5,000 hit means on YouTube really compared to everything else that are out there? What's the noise and what's the signal ratio? We just don't have an idea uh, in those kind of universe. Uh, and so there are a lot of these alternative so-called that, that, that's supposed to be supplementing the, the traditional metric, but we don't know what they're really accounting. Uh, and, and, and I'm also not convinced that they're truly alternative because if you look at the tools that are being developed, and I keep talking about this and people think I'm kind of paranoid, uh, there's the allmetrics.com, the company that, that's provide a service for this thing called All Metrics uh, is, if I could remember correctly, owned by a company that also is Macmillan, isn't it? Right. Also published the journal Nature. Uh, and so these are very, very powerful company uh, that are now creating new tools that is feeding back into the same traditional system that you are now thinking is an alternative. To me, they're not alternative. They're just additional services and payment you're going to give to the same people uh, from the same uh, limited pocket. Uh, so they are not truly alternative. Uh, to me, what we really need, I mean, it reminds me of the debate, again, we have uh, uh, with, with the developing country media. Uh, in the 1960s, UNESCO trying to encourage developing countries to uh, build up their media system. And, and what they have is really uh, Western trained journalists coming into uh, a lot of the developing countries and trained journalists and media to do Western style media. And they call them alternative media. But in fact, they were not really alternative. But a lot of indigenous movement have start, had in the 60s create Create us. And we don't want alternative media. We want our own independent medias. We want our own voices. Uh, and so uh, they have created in many countries in the developing world independent media that are much stronger and, and, and equally uh, uh, powerful in terms of their influence. Uh, so what we need are, are, are independent uh, metrics coming out from different places. We don't need uh, a, the same Western organized, uh, Northern institution, powerful one, creating standards for the rest of the world and say, now use this, then you become uh, part of what's being counted. Uh, I think that is perpetuating that, that unequal system, uh, just the same. And at the same time, uh, we're looking at all these uh, signals, you know, the kind of signals that we're, we, that, uh, 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 Cameron referred to, and uh, a lot of these signals, uh, one would say these are service signal, and yesterday I referred to, again, in the analogy, looking at developing development, uh, the constant usage of GDP as the sort of most important signal, uh, a measurement of a country's uh, status in terms of economic well-being. Now, those are also you know, this is analogous to journal impact factors. These are service, very, very shallow data. And, and what we need really are deep, meaningful data, uh, some of which Cameron referred to, but we really don't have a good handle on how to extract, connect, and tell a better story about these, these deep, meaningful data. But I think, again, we are being framed often by the existing 
framework. We're, we're, our language is so limited in terms of what, what we have, in terms of our tools to frame the kind of stories that we want to tell in different contexts. Uh, we've become homogenized in the way we tell our story uh, through the impact factors and, and other so-called alternative metrics that we need to break out of those. Uh, so this is what I'm trying to argue is that, is that metrics are not something simple. They're not tools that you just make and then they use. They're complex socio-technical uh, products that when you create a tool, there's a social system that allows that tool to be made, but that, it's also, that tool is very much embedded uh, in all kinds of technical assumptions, uh, who get to make them, who get to use them, and who get to perpetuate them, and so forth. Uh, we also know sociologists have this term called reactivity, and this well-known phenomenon, people uh, react to measurements. That is, when people know there are certain metrics that they have to, to, to live up to, they then adapt to behavior in order to maximize their, 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 their gain of that, that metrics. So if you change metrics, people will change their behavior. And this is, kind, is, again, very well known. So we have to be, this is a form of social engineering, if you will. Um, so again, metrics are not neutral. They are highly, highly, uh, uh, value-laden, so uh, this, when, when we look at these kind of new metrics being pushed out, we need to question who's pushing them, uh, for what purpose, and what are the technical, uh, technical uh, limitations, also uh, boundaries that are being uh, embedded in them. Now, um, as I said, I'm still very much working and living in an institution that is of some uh, 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 reputation. In fact, I was reading my email this morning, and this is in my email from my university, tooting his own horn about is being ranked the top university in Canada and number 24 in the world according to this Shanghai Putong University University ranking. How many have heard of the Shanghai University ranking? Right. So the Shanghai University ranking is familiar to many of us from Northern Institution, uh, maybe not as much from, from the Southern Institutions yet, but you must have heard of the Time Higher Education ranking as well, right? So, so, so there are a number of these univer uh, global university ranking, but the Shanghai ranking 2005 started by a graduate student in, Sh and in Shanghai University, this Putong University, uh, with his, uh, with his uh, professor. And they were kind of half joking that, oh, you know, uh, th they have these very powerful ranking instruments in the West and they ignore Chinese university and other university uh, in other parts of the world. Let's create our own ranking system uh, and then maybe our university will be better represented in this new ranking system. Except when they start making these metrics, they were replicating very much the same metrics that were used in the West. Uh, and so uh, if you look at it, um, the, this, this, this ranking uh, basically use uh, journal impact factor as one of the biggest thing. And if you have paper published in Nature and Science, you get a lot of points. So there's a point system. You can go through them. Uh, and if you publish in Nature and Science, you get lots and lots of points. Uh, and so um, uh, the university has, if you, if you want your university to rank very high, you basically can play by this score sheet. Uh, and ironically, a lot of Chinese universities have ex done exactly that. So in China right now, if you want to uh, get bonuses uh, at the end of the year, uh, if you have a paper published in Nature or Science, uh, as of two or three years ago, my understanding was a 100,000 US dollar bonus uh, to have a paper published in Nature or Science. And I think right now the, the bonus is even higher. So basically, there's a cash incentive to publish in these uh, high-ranking journals because it will boost the university uh, score in this global ranking system. And if you boost your global ranking, uh, you will have you draw better and more students and investments and so forth. The university become very much a, a globalized corporate corporatized system, right? I, the other day I, was, I received a survey from, uh, uh, from our planning people uh, and uh, inadvertently they left out the word in there uh, as what kind of products do you provide, right? It's not what courses we were offering, but what kind of products 
are we providing? Uh, and I learned a new terms a few years ago when I sat on committees. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the, what the term uh, B, uh, BIU means. BIU. It's called base, yeah? Oh, okay, business intelligence, so similar to that. It's, it's basic income unit. So each student is the BIU. So I was, I was listening to these people talking about, oh, next year we're going to get 3,000 new BIU, and then they this and this. And I have no idea what they're talking about until I found out that BIU means student. Uh, and then we create products to attract BIUs. Uh, and, and I'm saying all this, uh, and... Uh, is you know I do work in an institution like that, but not everybody obviously behaves uh, in that simplistic way. But the fact is, uh, uh, accountability in those terms uh, and metrics is becoming the the the. the Part, very much part of our existence. We spend time filling forms all the time uh, to be accountable to, so that we can provide uh, the kind of metrics that our, our administrator want. You can go to this website and look at uh, the different universities are kind of an uh, interesting uh, kind of exercise. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, most of the top university are in the U.S. Or to, to, of the Shanghai one to the two of the top ten, including uh, uh, Oxford and Cambridge were, were in there. Um, I mentioned the world, the other long-standing, uh, uh, the time higher education uh, ranking has actually been around longer than the Shanghai one, but the Shanghai is actually overtaken in terms of publicity. But you will notice that in the time higher education, and it's on the top there, it says powered by Thomson Reuters, right? powered by. Uh, you can read into that what that means. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and this diagram kind of reminds me a little bit of, of Cameron's diagram. This, this one, they created a corporate one about the, the, the importance of subscribing to their knowledge uh, products, right? So that if you are an administrator, uh, you can buy all kinds of intelligence about how your university is performing relative to other university. So you know what discipline and what equipment to invest in to maximize the research output from a university so that you can then gain further ground in, the, in their higher education ranking. Uh, it's very much like a stock market, right? And, and they don't even make any bone about it. it it's very much uh, a financial uh, bottom line. Now, what does all that mean in terms of real world impact? And I'll give you an example here. Many of you know China has been publishing like crazy. Uh, I was there a few years ago at the Chinese Academy of Science. They were telling me they have, uh, they're going to have, by 2015, uh, something like 300,000 PhD a year or something to that effect. And then, of course, overseas they're generating PhD uh, uh, by the thousands uh, in other institutions. But if you look at a lot of the publication pattern, and the tends to concentrate in certain area. So right now, I think chemistry, if I'm correct, uh, and physics, uh, the Chinese papers are ranked, if not number one or number two, very high uh, in terms of total output. Uh, uh, but it's in a lot of in, uh, important area, China is just, it's terribly la lagging behind. And a few years ago, there was this paper written about the, the consequence of this kind of drive to have a high output papers in hot topics area, right? And, and Alan this morning mentioned the kind of uh, the, the, the constraint. If you, if you want to get grant, you kind of find some sexy hot topic uh, to apply to, and so hopefully you'll get grant, and then your publication will be more likely to be cited in a, in a hot area. Whereas if you, if you look at neglected diseases, you look at area, uh, topics that uh, affect very local populations, uh, and those kind of paper tend not to be cited. And in fact, you have a harder time getting grants. So what happened is in the long a lot of regions across China, a lot of local important questions are not being researched. Uh, a lot of local health issues, a lot of local uh, uh, um, uh, governance issues, a lot of lo sci important scientific issues local, of local interest, if, if you will, or regional interest are not being studied in favor of the big hot topic like nanotechnologies and high energy physics and so forth because 
they get cited. Uh, and so uh, this article warned of the consequence in other developing countries, if higher education institutions buy into this framework, they will, they will then buy into a framework that will ignore their own research capacity uh, and, and in favor of playing a global game that so they are destined to lose anyway because there's no way to break into the top whatever hundreds. And last year, I remember reading a, a strategic plan from uh, one of the universities in Africa, I can't remember which one, uh, and it's actually, I can generalize like, across it. And the strategic plan in the first paragraph read, uh, by 2015, our university is gonna be in the top 350 of the ranking, right? So that's. That to, to, as a strategic plan, come on, you gotta do better than that, right? So, so, so the kind of vision uh, a lot of, uh, of leaders in university are not having is in, in terms of what they can provide to their citizens of, of, of the, that area. They're trying to play to a kind of global agenda to which they will, again, as I said, uh, uh, play to the detriment of their own uh, population and to their own mission. So, I have been looking at different way of looking at accounting. And this is a problem that many of us to work in non-profit or work in open uh, projects grapple with, right? Uh, so, so Alex just came over to do stuff for free. Software carpentry provide training for free and they recruit uh, their cause in some way or another. Allen's has a very different business model, but it's a struggle and so forth. But they are creating very, very important value in, in a system. And the question is, how do you capture this value? Uh, and, and how do you count them? Um, and there's actually a whole school uh, of, 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 of study called critical accounting. These are critical accounting, the people that study, you know, the traditional economics accounting and what, what and, and criticize what the traditional accounting system leave out uh, uh, in terms of what counts and what doesn't count. Uh, uh, for example, a couple of decades ago, these are the same people that point out that uh, when you look at a company's uh, output, you don't talk, just look at uh, the positive outputs, there are also negative consequences. There are ne negative externalities. When a company put out products, they also pollute the environment often. Those pollution have costs. Those costs have to be part of the accounting. You can't just count what is positive and ignore all the negative. So uh, increasingly, we need to understand that if we engage in a certain kind of, of arm race of metrics and so forth, we are also creating negative externalities on our own communities and on our own future health of our uh, scholarly system. Um, and there's a whole school, I found as some of my colleagues are doing this, social accounting, that because, uh, particularly in places like Canada, interestingly, there are hundreds of thousands of nonprofit uh, agency, and yet there are very little understanding on how to do accounting differently. That is, they will always look at income and then expenses. But uh, a lot of incomes that come in different kinds, the in-kind income, the volunteers and so forth, they all translate into real monetary terms, right? If, if I spend, you know, one week of my volunteer time, what would be the real cost of that time? That should be accounted for in terms of real dollars and so forth. So the social accounting people are pretty good at translating those into, uh, into, into dollars and cents that funders can understand. So I've been working with some of these social accounting folks to say, well, you know, we're doing these kind of projects. How do we say that we're capturing values that can then translate into terms that administrators and, and bean counters uh, and people with money would buy into. So that, for example, a daycare is a good example. A few years ago, our school put in a daycare uh, and one of the ec economists used a social accounting uh, formula that says, well, by the, the, the kind of social benefit that a mother would able to bring the baby to work uh, translate into all these kind of longer term saving. And the, and the administrators all oh, said, oh, okay, good, good, good. Uh, but in fact, the social benefit often is really one of the key one uh, that that needs to be emphasized. But if you tell the the administrator all these social uh, social benefit, they just don't know how to 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 justify that. 
And so we need to kind of broaden uh, our terms and value system. And we tend to talk about economic value. But in, in, our, in, in, the, in research and, and, uh, uh, and public institution, there are all kinds of different values. Uh, and we need to be able to, to speak these, expand our vocabulary, if you will. Uh, if I were to use Cameron's metaphor of the, of the canvas, uh, we need to have better paint palettes. We need to have more brushes. We need to have more hues of colors with which we can paint and tell different stories. Uh, and that requires us to expand uh, the way we think about what we are good at doing uh, in terms of capturing values in different contexts. Um, Okay, so I'll give you one final example because I'm running out of time. And this is, again, something very personal to, to, to convince my, my administrators that I, I'm of some values to the institution. And so I said, well, you're doing all this thing. Leslie is fine. You travel to India, do workshop and here and there. But how does that capture any values uh, for the university? Uh, and so uh, I look back to a very important uh, study uh, in the 60s. Uh, a guy named Ernest Boyer did a study commissioned by uh, the Carnegie Foundation. Uh, and back then, he already mentioned that you know, universities don't exist simply to do research. The university value is really contributing to the community. Uh, and he coined the phrase the scholarship of engagement. Uh, it means connecting the rich resources in the university uh, with the issues that are, uh, are central to the community within the university uh, is a part, uh, and public university ought to play that mission, and people, faculty who work in those public institutions ought to take uh, seriously part of the, their, their role as engagement. And so th throughout the entire process of discovery, doing research, and talking to the community, implying that research, and teaching, uh, and, and again, this blur the distinction between teaching and research because our university tend to segregate them. But teaching is a form of scholarship, according to Boyer, uh, and has to be uh, taken into account. And so I've, for a number of years, been thinking about how open access plays into part of this engagement. And if you think about uh, the kind of diversity of things that we do, in, in addition to teaching and research, we, we engage the community, we, we, uh, we do projects outside and, and uh, we do all kinds of different scholarly activities. A colleague of mine spent 30 years curating a database of um, uh, Tibetan manuscript, uh, without which, uh, uh, because he digitized all these things and put it online, many, many scholars are able to benefit from that curation. So that curation ought to be given uh, credit as well. So increasingly, we're seeing these being captured, uh, fortunately, uh, and uh, begin to be seen uh, by the people that counts, do counting, if you will. Uh, so again, I urge ourselves not to blame the system, but we do need to rethink a lot of the, the kind of value system that we have and uh, think about how we uh, function uh, in this institution as scholars and as researchers. And, and I'll end with this one final quote from Michael Wesch, some of you might have seen some of his stuff online. He's do, do been doing this thing called uh, digital ethnography and digital anthropology. And he had all kinds of very interesting lectures and video online. Uh, and he reminds us that we are in an interest, living in an interesting time um, uh, and allow us to ask interesting questions. So uh, uh, Yuri, you, know, you posed that question in the last session. Uh, and this, this is in part a response to that question. I'm not sure if it, you know, we have the answer, but I think we do have the freedom to ask more questions than, than we realize. Thank you. So actually it's just one, one tweet. That's my talk. So you can go home once you've seen that. Well, it's a complicated one, just like science. And, um, Many scientists um, criticize the use of Twitter because they say, well, it doesn't, uh, there's no possibility that it can ever contain anything useful. Um, and I'm inspired to do the talk this way because today ca there was a study that came out about, um, well, it was called 10 Simple Rules on How to Use Twitter uh, During Scholarly Conferences. And Nature ran a, an editorial or something on 
uh, how scientists actually use Twitter. So these two I saw while listening to these talks and uh, thinking about how I should present mine. And so this is it. Um, but it contains a hashtag so that the people following this um, conference can find it. And it contains links. And these are two of these 10 recommendations of what you should do if you're um, posting things during scientific conferences. So the first link is actually uh, there to answer the question by Leslie as to um, whether that quote is actually uh, attributable to Einstein. And things that it's complicated. We don't know. Um, so uh, some people say that in his office he had um, either a note or he had uh, written himself the note that uh, Leslie quoted, not everything that counts, counts basically. Where is it? Here, not everything that can be counted counts, not everything that counts can be counted. And then there's a whole story behind it, you have the link. Um, second one, we're also talking about old metrics. So let's have a look at this one. What it shows you is that some file has been uploaded to Wikimedia Commons in September 2012, so basically two years ago. And yeah, within days it got like 20,000 uh, views. This file, it's not a page on Wikipedia, but it's a file on Wikimedia Commons. And I'll show you what that file is. It's a video. Some of you have seen it if you have been there during the workshop on Tuesday. Um, I'll just show it to everyone. So there's a knife, there's a water drop, and a water drop is cut. And if you go down to the, to the source, you see, well, this comes from an academic paper, basically. Um, but the point is, there is an additional note here. It actually did not come from the paper itself. It come, came out of the research reported by that paper, but it was not included in the paper. So the, the scientists act, had actually preferred to write 10 pages on how you cut a water drop. And they've included screenshots and so on. They said, yes, we've taken video. But they did not publish the video. Because we're still so kind of confined, framed, in terms of papers, publishing papers. And that's the only thing that counts. Um, and um, we are so also sold to the idea of de describing things in a scholarly fashion that we prefer to write 10 papers of complicated text. I really tried to read that paper. I'm well educated in um, areas around this, but I had real trouble understanding it all. But once I saw the video, it was very clear. I showed it to my grandmother. She had no problem understanding what they've done. They, she questioned, but who needs it? Well, sometimes we have problems answering that question, but still she immediately grasped what happened. And uh, that's another part of uh, publishing that kind of uh, gets neglected way too often. And the point was I then went to those authors and asked them, well, if you have the video, what about uh, putting it up on the web and publishing it with the article? And they said, well, it's on the web, it's on our website, yeah, but we, uh, we simply didn't think about publishing it in the standardized fashion because we we're publishing papers. And then I asked them, well, can I put it on Wikipedia? Yes, of course. And they had no problem publishing it under an open license. They just hadn't thought about it. And once I put it up on Wikimedia Commons, um, immediately like 20,000 people a day were looking at this because it's a very peculiar video. Um, that is much more than uh, what people normally look at uh, single files on Wikipedia. Like an individual page on Wikipedia can get those hits, but an individual file on Wikimedia Commons, almost never. And it, it is science. It's really complicated chemistry and physics. The next one. I apologize again to some of you who've been in the uh, workshop on Tuesday. Let's see how, how this pays out. So ideally, you should have some visual and acoustic simulation right now. Uh, simulation to your thoughts and what I want you to think about is how we could visualize activity um, in science basically. This one doesn't work out for some reason, maybe there, uh, it's too complicated for the um, web connection that we have here. I just tested it on my laptop using the Wi-Fi and it worked 
Um, yeah, maybe it's Windows. Anyway, you have the link, and what you get there is actually a visualization of real-time edits of the Wikipedias. And I'm just, uh, I, I would like to see something like this for science. Like a visualization, what kind of science is actually happening right now? We have no idea. We have to wait three years until this is all published. And most of it will not be published anyway because it's not sexy enough to make it into those glamour journals in time before the ground runs out. Um, but um, in principle, if there were a system uh, like open notebook science were the way uh, to do science, then we could at least recover those things. We could find out who did what. If Einstein had, uh, had open notebook science, we would know whether it was his quote or not. Oh, this was it. Someone has it? Yeah. So, yeah, for his, on his computer it works, on, just on this one it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> plus one for Linux. Okay. Um, next one. We're almost done, right? This is a bot. Um, Alia has briefly introduced it. So what it does is basically it goes into a large scholarly database, um, PubMed Central, checks what uh, openly licensed articles are in there, and then checks whether these articles have video or audio materials and uploads them. And so we have one here from uh, basically just some minutes ago because this is on universal time. So just during the last few talks, it has uploaded those videos. And so for instance, we can have a look at this one. I haven't, I've never seen it. Probably no human has ever looked at this before. Um, but we can watch it. And it, it is imported automatically. And so just imagine um, if your lab notebook were openly licensed and published in a standard fashion, we could import those videos automatically into some place like Wikimedia Commons. So the world would see it Im immediately. You could even tag that. Like you could say, OK, I don't want this video to be uploaded, but this one is OK, or things like that. Uh, and then you wouldn't have to deal with that. And the world could use it right away. We wouldn't have to wait those three years or ask extra after you've published your paper without the review and so on. And now we're working on a system where we do not just import the entire no, the, the video, but we're importing entire articles into Wikisource, which is a sister platform of Wikipedia. It's kind of an archive. And um, this um, is tightly integrated with Wikipedia. And there is a... Um, a scheme that the Wikimedia Foundation, like the, the organization that runs Wikipedia servers and so on, has uh, in that certain um, mobile service providers um, provide access to Wikipedia and its sister projects for free. So that is, you don't pay data charges if you access Wikipedia or the, um, the copy on Wikisource. And this means that if the article is open access, openly licensed, it can be imported into Wikisource and then to read that, you don't have to pay anything, basically, other than electricity, because you don't pay any data charges, and you don't pay access to the article once you're on, uh, on the web. And uh, so that is another way to make things available to the community. And in Brazil, I'm not aware of anyone doing this, but in many African countries, um, there are no such, scream, such schemes that um, people can use to access the information. Um, Final link, since we're also talking about, how much time do I uh, have? You're fine. You're fine? Ten Still 10 minutes. Yeah, uh, we really want to encourage um, discussion. That's why I'm kind of trying to be shorter. Um, yeah, here we have a ranking. As uh, Leslie told us, university administrators, bean counters, they really like rankings. OK, so here we have a ranking. We're in the. Uh, metrics session, so uh, the man ranking is about metrics. And uh, what it does is it gives us the top most cited DOIs on Wikipedia. I won't go in, into details here, um, but point is most of the uh, most cited DOIs are certainly from not open access uh, articles, because simply most articles are not open access, especially from, uh, from the past. Um, but yeah, there are a few. Um, that are actually openly licensed, and we can do the stats. So we can provide the bean counters with the beans they want to see counted. Um, in addition to that, um, and here come, comes basically the bot again, 
uh, we can have a look at um, how individual materials from a scholarly article are being reused. I, I showed you the video before, and this is um, a, a fish that was imported in a similar fashion, just manually. Um, and if you look down here, it tells you the usage. This is automated. It's standard on Wikipedia. Why don't we have it for academia? Um, so whenever I go to a paper, if I still read a paper, I might really like to see the list of all the papers that I've cited it, of all the tweets that I've cited it, and so on. But it's hard to get. Within the Wikimedia universe, uh, we, we, we see it automatically. Like this image, we, of course, we see where it comes from. So here's the full, full information of the source. It was, as it happens, from PLOS One. Um, and, uh, but you can see it was used on the English Wikipedia, it is used on English Wikisource, it's used on the Russian, Swedish, and Chinese Wikipedias. And we see this immediately. And then we can click through the articles. Um, so for instance here, you see that, and uh, Leslie can verify that it actually makes sense. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so this is an, a new context. The um, scholarly article from which the image was taken was certainly not published in order to uh, provide the Chinese Wikipedia with this image, but we can use it that way because it's openly licensed. And finally, this um, slide or this, this page also leads me to something that could be called the real slide of my talk, which, with which I could then fill these 10 minutes that I have left. <laughs> Um, but I would actually like to, this to be a little more interactive. And it's actually the same page that we used during the uh, workshop on Tuesday, but I skipped a part that I will just walk you through a little bit now. And it's called, well, it, it consists of two parts, reality today and how things could be. So reality today is if we gather data, um, we basically publish it very rarely. So this. Uh, image captures the point at which data is, co uh, is captured. So the penguin walks through the gate and it is being measured in terms of weight and height. And uh, you have the precise time point, you know exactly where the gate is, and so you have a lot of data. Um, the people who took this photo, they wrote a paper about it and uh, published some nice pictures, but no data at all. And that's kind of, uh, even though they published in an open access journal, there's no data I cannot and if I were interested in the data, I would have to write to them I hope, uh, to hope that they would provide the data and so on. But I can't really just explore the data on my own. I can't ask a machine to explore the data and so on. So that's the, uh, the status quo, basically. You've already seen that video. So now, how could things be, actually? And for that, we have yet another link. Um, so. Some people have come together and described a vision for the journal of the future. Um, so here we go, you have the link. Um, the basic idea is um, illustrated in this research cycle. I stole that one many years ago from Cameron um, because I like it. Yeah, so it illustrates the research cycle. That's the purpose of this illustration of the research cycle. Um, because the research cycle is actually cyclic, you can start at any point. Um, so, for instance, you could start at the, the purple thing on the top left that is uh, labeled read. So you could start reading literature. You could start reading a Wikipedia article. You could start reading my tweet. And then, hopefully, for some of those reading acts that you're doing, there will be an idea that comes to your head or, or uh, comes up again after you've had it before already. Then, some of those ideas that you have will be developed. And in a research context, at some point, you will have to kind of ask for some money because most ideas, especially in experimental science, they require some money in order to be performed. You need an equipment, you need some materials, and so on. You might, might need a rocket <laughs> or, or uh, a range of mobile phones, whatever. If you're lucky, then uh, you get funded. Uh, once you have the funds, you can actually record new data. Once you have uh, new data, you can process the data. And once you have processed the data, you traditionally make the next step. You write it all up and you publish it. Um, if we were rational and would design such a system nowadays, the publishing would not be a separate step. It would, each of these small arrows would actually be a publishing step. And each of the individual steps that are now circles would actually be decomposed into mul multiple smaller circles with publishing arrows in between. And uh, 
you can do this. Many uh, people have lab notebooks. Um, if you have a lab notebook, you can have it electronically. If you have it electronically, you can have it on the web. If you have it on the web, you can have it in an open fashion. And once you have it in an open fashion, well, you can share it with the world immediately. And uh, the whole process then can continue. It's not such an artificial publishing step, but it's a continuous advancement until you finally stop doing science because you can't anymore or you, you don't want anymore. Um, and so um, the journal of the future or publishing uh, concepts of the future have to take into account that research is dynamic and try to publish the workflows rather than snapshots thereof. Okay, then there's, there's more to that. So for instance, here's an example. Um, I don't trust this connection anymore here. But uh, what the guy there d uh, did uh, is actually, he, again, he used Twitter. So he inquired the Twitter API as to uh, how many people had tweeted about uh, sunny or cloudy weather in California. And uh, then he, he plots uh, things here on this, on this graph. And uh, if we're lucky, then the graph will update. Uh, it's not visible now, but uh, in theory, this graph should update because um, there, it's not in a, a bitmap image uh, that is embedded here, but it is a graph that is dynamically created using a, a script, an R script that actually actively queries the API of Twitter and, and then generates the graph on that basis. And I think science would really benefit a lot if we had a way not just to take snapshots. The snap, snapshots are really useful. But in addition to that, uh, to provide a way uh, to, to visualize the life output of how things look like today. And we are so used to see this for the weather and many other things that affect us in our daily life, but we don't do it in science. Other things. Um, yeah, someone wrote a really angry blog post about why publishers don't accept uh, SVG, like editable graphics formats, today. It's linked from here. Um, the dynamics are also re reflected in, a, um, in an experiment that we're doing at the journal PLOS Computational Biology. So for topics in computational biology that do not have a good coverage on the English Wikipedia, um, people can write a review article, like researchers working in that field write a review article. Uh, according to the guidelines of both the journal and the English Wikipedia, it's being reviewed according to the guidelines of both. And once it's published in the journal, it goes live on the English Wikipedia, where then everybody uh, can update it. Um, yeah. And in principle, you can extend that. You can perform all the entire research cycle, basically, in one environment, which could be an IPython notebook, as already mentioned, or it could be a, another uh, environment. But um, for historic reasons, we tend to do each of these individual steps in different environments but we don't have to. The scope. Um, I already mentioned the, the journal PLOS 1 several times. It doesn't really have a scope in a traditional sense. It, uh, so it, it doesn't have the limit. One, well, the most recent reason for rejection of my manuscripts was it does not fit into the scope of the journal. I already mentioned to some of you that I hate this sentence, and if I think about it, I hate it even more, um, because it's not really um, fit for the time. Um, the scope of the journal, well, okay, but you should be hand, able to handle a manuscript. And uh, the journal PLOS One does this without having to li limit its scope. It just has a large editorial board and some mechanism to assign a manuscript to someone who is actually competent in that area. Um, another thing is, um, for instance, here you see the image of that uh, centipede. Normally, uh, New descriptions of a species, they came around with kind of, yes, it has uh, this number of, of um, feet, it has this number of antenna, and, and so on, and it has this color, and I found it under that stone, and that's it. But uh, we should also keep in mind the, the, the video of that drop that was cut. The equivalent here in describing new species is providing much more than uh, just that simple description that I've just given. So in this simple description. No, in this description, when this uh, species was newly described, it had with it some video of some living animals. It had with it micro CT, 
so non-invasive imaging. It had DNA barcoding. It had its full transcriptome described, um, plus all the traditional stuff. So you can publish much richer stuff, and it's just one paper in the end. And if you look at um, the history of uh, publishing genomes, like uh, initially, um, Genomes, for every genome that was uh, sequenced, there was a big paper around it, typically in one of those glamour journals. Nowadays, most genomes go without any formal publication. They just go directly into the database. Okay, if you've already seen the fish, think about it as uh, a, an, a very adventurous fish. It does also other things on Wikipedia. So, for instance, if you click on a reference on Wikipedia, you typically, typically get um, all the metadata here. And we are working on a system that will not give you the, just the ordinary metadata, but in addition, information as to what is the license of that reference that is being cited. Then that the, the full text is available on Wikisource, as I already explained, and that the images are available on Wikimedia Commons, and that the data are available on Wikidata. So we can integrate the uh, sources much more with the kinds of reuse and we can tell people look here's something that you can reuse if you're looking for images of fish maybe this category is worth a click and also I can go back many publishers have a problem uh, bringing us uh, back and forth between these annotations you can reach it I typically have uh, like two versions of the same paper open so that I can kind of look at the references in place Another aspect of the journal of the future is that it should really stress replicability. Uh, it's a complicated word, and one of the speakers that we had in the previous session had a big trouble pronouncing it in por Portuguese. I have similar trouble in English, but, uh, and scientists have problems in general with that concept. We are simply not used uh, to publish our research in a way that facilitates reproducibility. Review. Peer review is one of the cornerstones of uh, science, but it is typically understood as having to occur before publication. I think that's completely wrong. The real review um, happens anyway over time if multiple people who are, have maybe <laughs> multiple different um, sets of skills or experiences around the topic of that paper um, had the chance to actually look at this. So the two or three people who see the thing before it's published in the current system, they may or may not be good reviewers. Uh, some of them try, some of them don't try, and many are somewhere in the middle. Uh, but uh, in any case, it takes a lot of time, especially from the author's perspective. They submit that thing and then they wait, wait, wait. There was another angry blog post about this today. Um, and. Um, we should really experiment with uh, different ways of uh, doing peer review. So for instance, uh, we could do the uh, peer review always after publication, or we could ask the, the authors to um, come along with a review already, and if then the review and the name of the reviewer are being revealed along with the paper that is being submitted, many of the problems uh, that come along with if an author asks a colleague to review his paper uh, will not be as severe because it's all transparent. Like if he, said, if he does, hasn't really read the, the paper uh, or if he's just trying to be charming to his friend, this will be obvious to everyone who reads it. So um, yeah, we can experiment uh, around that. Or there's, uh, you can have review in multiple stages. Some journals operate on this already for 10 years. Like you submit your manuscript, it goes live uh, immediately. And then the review takes place in public. Like the journal invites the reviewers just as with any other journal, just in public. The reviewers that are invited, they have to make their reviews public. They can uh, hide their name, but the review has to be public. And the community can comment within that period as well. And then after some time, the editor decides whether this is um, going to be a published article or not, or whether it's going to enter a revision or not. So we can make that uh, process more transparent. Or other journals have chosen to publish the reviews once the uh, manuscript is published, and so on. So we need more experiments in that. Presentation, uh, yeah, so far basically most of the things that are being published by scholarly publishers, they are still aimed at the paper, at a PDF. Um, there's basically no interaction. Like if there's a geo coordinate, I would like to see the map. Where did it happen? Where did they find these things? And so on. And uh, if there is a species or so, I would like to see 
a link to some more description of the species and so on. Most publishers don't do it. Some have started to experiment with that. And so on. So another thing is figures um, are very often composed into composite figures. Uh, but this is not really necessary on, online. You could do this on the fly using things like CSS, like here, for instance. So if you look at, at this, once it loads, yeah. So here, for instance, figure two. It's, it has a figure 2a, and it has a figure, if I want to see the whole thing, I can, I can see it, and I can also click on figure 2b. But uh, basically, there's very few publishers that do that. Um, and uh, that, again, from the Wikipedia perspective of a reuser, it would really be very nice if we could have individual images rather than the combined ones, because the author of the original manuscript spends a lot of time combining all those images into uh, this composite thing, uh, which then has a lower resolution than the original images that he has put in there. And then the reusers, like on Wikipedia, spend a lot of time decomposing that composite thing. It's just a stupid um, waste of time. Transparency, if there is conflicts of interest amongst the editors or anyone involved with the journal or the manuscript or the research that is reported in the manuscript, this should be much, made much more transparent than it is today. And sustainability, uh, like resources are limited, the, this includes the time of the reviewers and so on, or time of people who are sitting in the audience. And uh, so you should always be aware of uh, that and it should inform the workflows much more than it does today. And finally, the last point, I, I have um, listed eight criteria. We can't switch all of them uh, entirely in one go. So we have to be flexible somehow. And uh, to close, with um, some examples that are unusual for publishing and maybe lead us to the, um, to the discussion. I wanted to show you some of the science papers with the shortest um, messages, which kind of closes the loop to my rather short um, tweet. So here there is one paper, um, which is an editorial and it just says enough already. And because it has been uh, at the end of a long debate where one group of researchers has written a paper, another group of researchers has written a paper contradicting that paper and so on and so on. And then the editorial at some point just said enough already. Um, another one is, well here, can apparent superluminal neutrino speeds be explained as quantum weak measurements in the abstract? Probably not. <laughs> We should have more of those abstracts. And finally, a, a, what, what is it? a psychologist had writer's block. And so he wrote a paper. The unsuccessful self-treatment of a case of writer's block. You see the full paper here. That's it. And it w and went through review with the comment um, of the review wrote, I have studied this manuscript very carefully with lemon juice and x-rays and have not detected a single flaw in either design or writing style. I suggest it be published without revision. Clearly it is the most concise manuscript I've ever seen, yet it contains sufficient detail to allow other investigators to replicate Dr. Upper's failure. In comparison with the other manuscripts I get from you containing all that complicated detail, this one was a really real pleasure to examine, and so on. And I hope we can continue with some real pleasure in the discussion. Acho que a gente pode é, pegar, é, receber perguntas da audiência. É, se alguém tem comentários, perguntas para fazer sobre esses assuntos todos que a gente passou. É, acho que tem uma já ali, o Ryuri. Mais alguém? O Alex. Bom, podemos começar com... Deixa eu desligar aqui. É, na verdade, eu não sei se eu tenho uma pergunta, mas eu fico com vontade de falar. <risos> É, mas, assim, é que acho que estar tá aqui hoje e poder participar desse evento e, e poder ouvir o Leslie falar e né, ouvir cada um falar é, é extremamente inspirador é, a ponto de vista de alguém que eu já tive uma certa decepção assim, com, com, a, com a ciência e tal. E até o nosso objetivo de vida foi eu e minha família sair viajando e fazendo ciência de uma outra maneira, encontrando problemas é, 
no meio rural, onde pessoas que não têm nem energia elétrica, não conseguem desenvolver coisas muito básicas. né? É, então, é, mas no ponto de vista dessa coisa da de, de como a, a ciência está hoje, essa perspectiva de né, novas maneiras de se avaliar trabalhos científicos e, e o como isso pode mudar, é, vendo uh, em cima do, do que o Leslie falou, é, eu penso que, eu, até a, a pergunta talvez surja aí, é, parece que às vezes uh, o problema sempre gira em torno em torno de, de uma questão financeira. né é, Sempre é, uh, o dinheiro ele acaba estando no meio e é isso dificulta de certa maneira é, será que não seria possível uma não sei uma forma de, de, de se fazer ciência numa relação de troca numa relação em que é, se precisasse cada vez menos de, de, de ter uh, o, o dinheiro em si envolvido mas a troca de não só de conhecimento às vezes necessidade de equipamento necessidade de, de várias coisas e a gente pudesse ter sei lá de repente uma alguém que fomentasse numa base de troca inicialmente e depois a gente pensaria é, nas necessidades financeiras enfim é só uma uma divagação não sei se sei lá thank you that was perfect because I have the the more sinister and capitalist version of that question which and this is mostly directed towards towards Leslie so I mean in in your talk I saw uh, I saw a lot of interlocking systems of, of metrics where you have the students who didn't want to break with the traditional um, grading metrics you had the grading metric the evaluation metrics for your performance as a teacher and you have the um, academics uh, worried about their evaluation and how those metrics play into the university evaluation the universities in turn are motivated by by their metrics so there's there's kind of two parts to this one are all metrics created equal in the sense that as soon as you have a transparent metric people are going to attempt to game it and is that is that just part of the system or is that you know that there are some metrics are better than others and you accept that you know the most motivated people are always going to try and find ways to, to to scheme that and and the other side of that coin being is that all of these metrics kind of exist you, you can think about them as existing as part of a, a, a economic system as, as was just pointed out um, so my, my dark capital side to this is, can we, is it necessary to have an ec economic incentives that are on the same scale as the existing ones to, to really have kind of like revolutionary change as opposed to, to little incremental ideas? Let me let me get let me respond. Huh? Hello. Um, hello. So, quick quick response to Alex, if, if I could be quick, and then to Yuri's. I really want to answer that. So, uh, the cynical side of me says again, because we have a, a economic system that is putting more pressure on the institution to be certification machines. Uh, and, uh, and so to, do this, to be the certification machine, you're going to have to give some of these simple metrics. And students have gotten used to the idea that, OK, they come to university, they pay for it, they got values of value being a certification. And they don't really care about what they learn to a lot, a lot of students, I hate to say. All they care is they pass the course, pass 20 courses. In our case, you count 20 credits you got your diploma and then you go on to whatever you do, right? So we have gotten f un terribly comfortable with that system. And a lot of students who are sort of discouraged by that and they really do come to want to learn. And they do, they do accept different way of, of, of assessments and so forth. But that, they, unfortunately, they're in the minority. Uh, I want to blame it on a, a larger picture, right? I mean, we have a global system whereby uh, we are turning everything to the marketplace. 
that you know somehow market would decide best you know so that everything could be measured in terms of uh, who you provide the best product and then the, 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 the buyers will decide and the university becomes subjected to the system and the government thought oh good we don't have to put in as much money to the university because we can let these competition drive the you know the best university for the best number of units you know uh, and so the, then the government pulled back their support and their resources and we see that in Canada and many different countries the UK gutted their support for public uh, university and so I, I want to go back to those kind of go the, 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 the political system that that is gutting our public institution it is not a matter of not enough money we have lots of money in most cases in most countries half enough for more people to do research than it is now. But we have, as Paul mentioned yesterday, this winner-takes-all system where some elite institutions and researchers, they get everything. They get grants after grants and millions and millions and millions of dollars, whereas mo majority of the researchers struggle for small little grant, you know, so that they can write the next grant and the next grant. And then a lot of people have no grants at all. And there has been a study that was done in Canada by and some, some management professor uh, in science and engineering in Canada. They were looking at, at the adjudication cost to give out 40 grants. Uh, uh, and they said the cost to give out the small number of grants uh, actually w cost more than it would be the case if they were to give the whole pot of money equally to all the applicants. Uh, and and if all the applicants, you know, get some small money to have seeds start up to do their research, some of them will fail. Some, but a lot of them will will go somewhere. Instead of everybody fail, uh, and one or two sort of uh, sort of betting on the big winners, those kind of things. So, uh, I blame our funding system and allocation of resources. Uh, we need smarter people to allocate funding, and so that funding could be more equally or more, more equitably distribute, distributed. And a lot of those signs that you talk about, you know, don't cost a lot of money. They don't. Uh, it's just a, a lot of cases. You could have borrowing system. And in, in Pakistan, they started a system of now uh, identifying certain ba uh, share infrastructures, uh, lab, lab spaces and so forth, that are paid for by a common pot. And then different researchers could take turn using those those uh, equipments and so forth. So that's one example. But but you, you're talking about even something more basic, you know, taking research outside of conventional institution. And frankly, we don't have good model for those. But I would love you to help us think about some of those models uh, as part of our research uh, network. Yeah. If I can give a slight, slightly, slightly. If I can give a slightly more positive answer in some ways. Um, Part of, part of, I think, what we're learning is that some of the incentives don't need to be as big. Um, you can do an awful lot with modifying, I'm going to I'll use that word deliberately, modifying people's behaviour with things like likes and retweets. And you know, people do a lot of things to get attention on a small scale and feel like people are paying attention to them. And there's some, I mean, I really recommend reading um, Dana Boyd's book, um, It's Complicated, which is supposedly about American teenagers, but it's actually really about the research community, as far as I can tell. They seem to be identical in terms of behaviour. Um, but the, and her, her point is about how the, the behaviour of American teenagers is all about finding their place in society, of sharing objects, pictures, video, whatever it might be, that elicits a reaction, which is very similar to what we do as researchers when we release an output. So all we really need to do, I mean all, is to create a space in which that kind of reinforcement occurs when you release the data set, when you release the... And actually there are things we can do, and Daniel alluded to this, you know, we've, one of the things we've identified recently, um, or not we, but um, people at Crossref, the DOI registration agency, is that, is that Wikipedia is the eighth largest referrer of traffic to scholarly literature through the Crossref DOI referrer. Say that within a bunch of publishers, and they really pay attention. So suddenly, in the last three weeks, publishers care about Wikipedia all of a sudden. And that's got to change behavior. But think about that, what it means to the researcher when you go to them and say, actually, your, your, your image got three million views. Um, and suddenly, that becomes, becomes a powerful motivator. And a story, again, a story they can tell about, about how their work makes a difference. Um, 
I don't know how far that takes us towards a, a bartering economy. I think we don't need to have a cash economy of this, but in terms of providing that infrastructure layer, again going back to, to Paul's talk, it's difficult to barter in a condition where you don't have your basic needs reasonably satisfied. And I think until when we need to figure out how we move up Maslow's hierarchy, as it were, in terms of the ability to, to create space for bartering of knowledge or, or co-production or, or models of co-production and new institutions that support that. Um, and I don't know what those look like either, but I think it's, it's something we need to explore. Um, just a few comments on that. Um, so um, if you do open notebook science, some aspects of bartering come in more or less automatically. Um, so um, someone will at some point read your notebook because it's indexed by Google within 20 minutes of, of, of your writing it uh, or writing that entry. And so people Googling for those terms that you have been used in describing your very recent work will eventually end up. And some of them will uh, start some interaction. And so sometimes it happens to me that I'm just taking notes for myself of what I have to do tomorrow. And the next day I wake up and somebody has um, added a pointer on how to facilitate that for me, or sometimes even done that job for me already, um, without me even knowing them. Simply because for them it's fun to do that, <coughs> or they want to learn something. They said, oh, I, I wanted to learn something about Python anyway, and here's someone having a problem with Python. Why not me having him solve this, uh, or have, helping him solve this? And uh, so there's some aspects that simply come in uh, through being open, and uh, there the bartering analogy doesn't really fit. Um, another thing, if we consider that we cannot entirely escape the mo money e economy, we could think of uh, things like an, a money equivalent to the Google 20% uh, time rule. Like uh, Google allows some of its workers uh, to spend about 20% of their time, of their paid Google time, on projects that are not really. Uh, official Google projects. It's not what their boss tells them to do. And if we had uh, a budget allocation in which you could spend a certain amount of money of your budget on other projects, uh, especially on projects run by other people, we would have part of such a uh, bartering uh, um, option. And we could be much faster in response to some need. Like if now uh, Ebola research is really necessary, uh, then the, the researchers could kind of bundle their um, parts of their budget quickly, like within days or whatever is technically feasible, and then we have some sizable bucket of money to actually do Ebola research. And we don't have to wait those months or so that it takes to go through the additional uh, uh, process of getting funds to do some uh, emergency relevant um, research. Also, Perguntas? Eine... Ah. What is the missing... Uh, the missing... the piece missing in the puzzle so you, we have more articles in, with videos and uh, animations because most of the people don't publish the videos and animations and medias. I guess that one was for me. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm certainly not aiming at having even more articles. Um, if, especially if you think of this example where, uh, of that speci specific manuscript track in computational biology that I was referring to, where you have a an expert written and expert reviewed review article about a certain topic that is editable. What I want people to do is not write another 10 page uh, report about how to cut a drop, but to use the, the existing article and to add whatever they have to add to this article, which will then be just one line or a paragraph or something, or they change the picture or add a video or something, but it's much less than 10 pages. And it's also easier to write, it's easier to review, and uh, if there is more detail needed, they just link to their open notebook. So um, I certainly want to facilitate the whole thing, and we should stop thinking in articles. And, but as long as we keep uh, thinking in articles, 
Uh, the important thing is to remember we don't want to have more, we want better ones. All right, I'll disagree slightly, um, but I'll but, but yeah. So, so spe speaking 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 for the publishers, one of the things we don't do um, is make it easy. Um, you know, there are we at the right at the moment. Um, you cannot put a video in the um, the central text of a PLOS article. That will hopefully change over the next few months. Um, and it is there's there's a whole series. I mean, I can make a lot of excuses for why that is, um, but one of the core reasons is that it's difficult to do at scale and consistently given the variety of formats, the variety of systems and the way different different we don't have any traditions around how to, to track and manage these things. But the way to motivate people, I think, is a relatively simple one in again, one something that's relatively simple but also very complicated. Which is that we need to help we need to give people the data that lets them show that those those things are being used. So we need as a publisher to show that the video of that fly muscle um, actually operating in real time um, has been viewed two million times on YouTube and we need to pass that to the authors so the authors can pass that up their system. And be when people start talking about the way their research is being used, and yes a lot of these numbers are in some ways meaningless because there isn't a, a good comparator to give them to, but it allows people to tell the story and I have seen a grant proposal in which the person justified the impact of their research on the number of YouTube views rather than the research articles they published. Now you might think this was some nice, this, this was research about kittens or you might think this was some ecological research or environmental research. These were actually tutorials on how to use a very abstruse piece of computational tooling that had been viewed 10,000 times on YouTube. Um, and that was the evidence of use. So evidence of the use of the software. Helping people to tell those stories, making the choice to tell those stories about these types of use will start to change the system. Because at the end of the day, the vice chancellors and the ministers don't care about citations. They don't care about patents. They want to be able to tell the story about how the research they are funding is making a difference. They want to get re-elected. You don't get re-elected by citations, you get re-elected by telling the story about how this made a difference. Tem mais alguns minutos. Tá bom. Um, before, hello? Yeah. Before um, I started doing GenSpace, for the years, 10 years before that, I was doing research in tobacco uh, related uh, disease. And the thing that tortures me about what we're talking about now is the time factor. Uh, this was a disease that took 20 years to manifest. I was looking for surrogate markers and it seems like a lot of what we can see immediately in this are just surrogate markers of the eventual impact of things and um, it's hard to tell whether a surrogate marker is really a marker um, and we can argue about what the actual changes that we want in the end from it but I don't know if, if, if the panel would just comment on that, um, I'd be interested. No, I was I actually, I'm glad you raised that because when, when you gave an example, I think in that specific context it might make sense, but as a social scientist, I think most of social scientists deal with that by nature long term. You know, if you want to talk about the benefit of early childhood education, that's by definition looking at somewhere tw 10, 15 years down the line, right? So, uh, so, so looking for those proximate marker has always been a challenge. And I'm concerned that because we have all these signals out there that we can tend to extract as if that they're approximate indicators, we, we don't have a good enough handle on what actually is our, our, our uh, things that are connected. So I would say yes, interesting, but we, we need to do more investigation about what it is that we're creating and who's creating those things. 
to allow us to tell the story. I'm still paranoid about who's giving us the tool to tell the stories because they're not neutral tools. Yeah. And, and I, I agree, I, I would often use the word proxies rather than signals um, for the reason that they're, they're, these things are only, are only ever proxies of the thing that we're actually interested in. Um, but I think you know it's a, it's a world in which we have to make these choices. I mean, it would be nice to wait 20 years and figure out how we should design our institutions. Um, we have, you know, in the US, we have maybe five years to renegotiate the social contract for science, um, or it will you know, funding will just disappear. Um, it'll take longer in Europe, um, but unless we can make the case with some form of evidence. And, you know, and we should be, and this is the argument we're currently making in the UK, we should be applying all of the machinery we have of critical analysis and discourse analysis and power, power, understanding the power relationships and where these things are coming from and what the, what the underlying narratives are. We should be applying all of the apparatus of scholarly critique to what we're doing. But I don't think we can afford to do nothing. Um, we have to make some choices and do the best we can. And at the end of the day, that's what we do as researchers. No one, no one ever collected a data set about any phenomenon that was perfect. We don't wait until the data is perfect before we try to draw the conclusions we can. We have a whole apparatus for understanding how to go from incomplete data to the best conclusion we can manage at the moment. Um, We've managed to do that in large part by keeping ourselves hermetically sealed from the rest of the world, so they don't under, don't understand how the sausage is made. Um, but I don't think we have that excuse anymore, and so we have to both act and think and and measure and critique all at the same time. I've been listening to this fascinating, <clears throat> fascinating discussion. Uh, I've listened to a, a number of discussions that are over time in different, different gatherings of people uh, who are involved in teaching and research. Uh, and, it, and the discussions run along, uh, have, have run along very much the same lines. Uh, and one common uh, one thought which has resurfaced in listening to this is that uh, the, uh, the, the problems of persuading uh, important uh, power centers in, in, the in the society of the use of science uh, is uh, complicated by the very short time horizons of uh, people who control decisions which will have long-term uh, effects. And, um, the tendency uh, on the part of researchers and people in science to present science as uh, a, a whole. Uh, there are good reasons for that, but uh, it doesn't do justice uh, to uh, the uh, value uh, of scientific capabilities which exist and which have to be formed, uh, and which have to learn uh, how to be more effective in the exercise of these capabilities. And when you start down that line, you begin to see that the capabilities have uh, different time horizons uh, and different speeds of reaction uh, to uh, problems which are presented. And uh, there's a kind of mismatch uh, in that uh, if you want uh, a kind of science which responds to very, uh, in a very quick way uh, to uh, evident demands or needs of society, then uh, we are looking in the wrong direction uh, because it's the private commercially oriented sector which has the incentive structure and the command of resources uh, to do that. But people working in science, uh, in academic science, uh, whether they are uh, doing this professionally or they're doing science as uh, citizens and amateurs, uh, often are attracted uh, by the idea of uh, producing something whose payoff will be varied 
and distribute it over a long period of time, which will be of very different values to different constituencies. Uh, and so uh, there are some things that turn out that, that the scientific community can deliver answers to a problem which they were not thinking about because in thinking about something quite different, they've developed a capability. And so in response to, to, to Leslie's um, call uh, to get sort of somehow get organized and be able to produce evidence, I think uh, that one ought to uh, be willing uh, to devote some resources to going back and trying to design a course of historical inquiry which will not be uh, overly biased uh, by uh, picking uh, spectacular instances because the selection, selection bias, if you try to, to trace where some great advance came from, you, know, you are often not seeing uh, how many other things which actually didn't produce the advance yet that you've noticed. Uh, if you go back further in time, uh, you can find a lot of things which emerge. Uh, to be terribly useful. So you know, if you went back and you, and you went only 30 years or 50 years back uh, and you thought, uh, okay, so 50 years back, what was the payoff from Einstein's paper uh, on, uh, the, uh, on the, the, uh, the, the electron effect? Okay, uh, okay, the le okay, this is a 1905 paper. Um, it wasn't until really the development of lasers uh, that people found any practical uh, thing which came from that. And even when they had managed to produce coherent light uh, with the ruby laser or other, uh, other lasers, uh, they didn't quite know what to do to, with it, okay? Nobody had a, a use. So the, the first uses of the laser were, were, complete, were completely trivial. Well, not to the people who were using them, as I, I mentioned, uh, uh, I, I mentioned the Daniel conversation, the late, I think it was, it says that the laser's first use was a labor-saving device in, in chemistry labs. How did that? Well, it displaced one research assistant who was holding the other piece of the string uh, to align, uh, please, to align please, the equipment. So please I'm conclude, saying, What Peter? I'm saying is you, you, you need to have a lot of different time frames and to do, uh, and to show people uh, what the time distribution no, is going to be and what the value of creating of having people doing science as a capacity i don't okay. like that people okay don't peter like it if I please conclude out, if i point out that the mobilization of scientific resources to solve some existential problems uh, in in wartime is a good example of fact all right <laughs> thank you peter let me just okay. say that if we practice open sci notebook science now, historians will have it easier later on. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's a good conclusion. And, and a partir disso, eu convido todo mundo a estar aqui amanhã quando nós vamos ter a sessão sobre cadernos de pesquisa abertos. E uma boa noite para todo mundo.